Okay. Welcome everyone to my talk, Lira, Destructing Full Text Search Industry with JavaScript. It's a quite of a strong claim, I know. <laughs> we will see if we can get hopefully there. So before we start, let me introduce myself very, very quickly. Let me see if this is working. Yes, okay. So I'm Michele, I'm from Milan in Italy. I work as a senior architect at Nearform. I'm a Google developer expert and a Microsoft MVP. And when I talk about full text search engines, I always wanna start praising the god of full text search engines out there, Elasticsearch. So believe me when I say that Elastic has been the project that got me into open source. I love it. I tried, um, I had the opportunity in my career uh, to work with the Solar, with Lucene directly, but Elasticsearch, it's just on another level. I love it so much. Um, I had um, an opportunity in the past to work a bit on uh, Apache Unomi, uh, contributing to that project. And Apache Unomi, it's a customer data platform and it's an open source project, of course, that uses Elasticsearch as a leader database in its uh, architecture. And okay, I was pretty junior at the time, uh, but when I saw millions and millions of data coming through every week, I was like, how is that possible, right? How can a software uh, handle that much data, that's incredible, and still be performant. So it doesn't matter if you have like one million records, one billion records, Elasticsearch, it's always performant. So how? How does it do that? Do that? Um, if you're not into Elasticsearch, uh, just for you to know that basically it uses Apache Lucene, just like Solar, but provides a nice of good features on top of it. So Lucene, it's the actual full text search library uh, that performs the search operations, but Elasticsearch does a lot on top of it. So it's a RESTful server, so you don't have to code Java, which for me was super good. Um, it's a distributed system, uh, which basically allows you to uh, scale horizontally your, um, your data, uh, sorry, your cluster, adding more and more data without losing any performance. Uh, it auto-manages sharding for you. It takes care of data consistency, uh, monitoring, cluster management. It's awesome. So before proceeding any further, let me be super clear from the beginning. I love Elasticsearch. And yes, I am talking about something that I built that it's hopefully competing, but I did that because I wanted to learn more about how is it possible to have such a good product, not because I didn't like it. I want this to be very clear from the start. And also, I don't have a computer science degree and that's the only way I can learn stuff. So what I cannot create, I do not understand. And I'm quoting Richard Feynman here. I need to build stuff to understand how things work. So, remember I love Elastic, but still I had some, some problems with it. It's quite hard to set up and deploy. It's hard to upgrade, so if you have like a security patch to be uh, deployed, uh, released, it's not the easiest thing you're gonna do. and has a big memory footprint, so if you couple that with CPU, high CPU consumption, it is very, very expensive. So if you're running your own cluster on AWS, Google Cloud Platform, whatever, it's gonna be very costly. And if you're using the cloud version, of course, it's also costly because someone has to compute that data, right? And maybe, Maybe I was too inexpert and Elasticsearch was a bit too much for me. I know that making simple software is hard, but it's worth trying it. So I set myself a goal. I had the unique opportunity to speak at We Are Developers in Berlin this year. It's the biggest developers conference out there. It's 8,000 developers coming from all over the world. And I set a goal. I want to give a talk on full text search algorithms, data structures. I mean, I want to explain to people how it works. So that was my goal. I, I can work in two modes. With goals, by building stuff. That's all I need and a bit of luck, I guess, because when I started looking down and going down the rabbit hole um, with the, the theory behind full text search, I mean, it's not an easy thing. And that's why we all love Algolia, Elastic, Maily Search, etc. all beautiful products. But I definitely wanted to learn more. Also, the hard truth, you need to study algorithms and data structures if you want your code to be that performant. We will get there later on. And 
again, not having a computer science degree myself, I don't have like a place in my mind where I can go and see, oh, maybe I studied this algorithm, maybe I seen my professor. No, I had to actually start searching for stuff. And also, when you, when you start understanding how things work, you need to choose a programming language to implement your algorithms, your data structures. And of course, I wanted to be a cool guy, so I, what, Haskell? No, no, cool kids don't use Haskell. I wanted to use a cool guy. <laughs> so I started implementing with Rust. Too complex, no way. <laughs> I have no idea how. I've been programming Haskell for a, for a bit, so I thought, okay, Rust might be easier, right? No, it's not. Uh, but it's super cool, and I'm definitely the problem here. Um, I also started refactoring everything in Golang. Same problem. <laughs> I spent my life writing TypeScript and JavaScript, basically. So I remembered a famous quote from Jeff Atwood, also called the Atwood Law. Um, he's the co-founder of Stack Overflows that says, any application that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript. So why not? JavaScript is the king of programming languages, right? Yes. <laughs> I guess. So yeah. And that actually led me to something that I wasn't expecting. When I started implementing the data structures required for uh, implementing full text search, such as trees, hash maps, inverted indexes, etc., I made a comparison with Rust and Golang, which, okay, maybe weren't so well optimized, of course, but I started thinking that there is no slow programming languages, but just bad algorithms and data structure design. So that's the, the first thing I want you to bring home. Uh, this is an essential part of our job. And when I started making benchmarks, when I gave my talk, people seem to be impressed with the speed and we will see benchmarks later on. So um, eventually, my team at Nearform decided to open source this, so we released Lyra, uh, which is a very nice name, especially if you're here in Lyra. I don't know how to pronounce, but. Uh, by the way, it is nowadays an open source project, so whatever you're gonna see from now on, there's no premium features, there's, no, there's nothing, it's all open source. And it's maintained also by good community. There, a good community has born around it because we decided to code everything from scratch. And we decided to do that without any dependency for a very specific reason. When we started looking at other alternatives such as Minisearch, Fuse, Lunar, which are full text search um, engines built in JavaScript, which are exceptional, don't get me wrong, they are very good, um, we wanted to do something a bit different. We wanted our search engine to run literally everywhere. So we had to implement everything from scratch, starting from the prefix trees, the inverted indexes, B trees, tree maps, the stemming algorithms, and we will get there after um, stock words and support multiple languages such as Italian, English, I don't know, um, German, whatever. And eventually we did it. So nowadays Lira is working on every single JavaScript runtime. All the runtimes you see there, plus Graal VM. Is there anyone knowing Graal VM? I'm sorry for you guys. <laughs> yeah, but Rhino, if you, if you really want to get fun, you know, wherever JavaScript runs, Lira runs, it's all made for in pure JavaScript, no dependencies at all. But that also opens to a world of possibilities, you know? Lira works in browsers, on BAN, on Dino, uh, React Native, Node, Lambda functions, and Netlify functions and Cloudflare workers, which are exceptional platforms which gave us a couple of problems. In fact, I was in Berlin again, and I met an engineer that told me, you know what, it would be cool if you could run full text search on the edge on Cloudflare workers or Netlify functions. Um, it was very hard, but I had, you know, um, thankfully I worked with Paolo, who is gonna give a, a talk on Wednesday. And uh, we were in the hotel hall together, and I said, how can we make it run at the edge? Michele, hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's all he said, and we made it. So I'm gonna showcase later, but we basically created a um, very tree shakeable and <clears throat> a very tree shakeable and tiny full text search engine. And let me give you an example of how it works. So you basically want to create a new variable and you create a new database. You insert a schema, so it's not really schema-less like Elasticsearch, for example. Uh, still, you have to define your schema and your types for your data, which really helps us in uh, creating uh, the index. 
Um, when you're going to deploy it, you can bundle it. For example, uh, if you deploy it on Cloudflare workers, you might not need the insert, uh, the insert function or the create function. You just want to perform search. So you just import search, and it's tree shakeable. You only get your bundle with the search uh, function. In fact, the DB um, variable in that case, it's nothing more than a JavaScript object. Uh, that was a bit surprising to me because uh, JavaScript object, every time you modify the shape of the object gets slower, that's what I thought. So that's why at, the, at first we, we start implementing with maps, with sets, which are known to be faster you know, than maps. But eventually we discovered that for our specific use case, objects and arrays were just perfect. So that's another discovery I made. There are cases most of the times where new JavaScript features such as uh, maps, weak maps, or sets are faster in many cases. There are cases where the standard JavaScript is just fine. So always measure your performances. Then you can insert data, and this is blocking the event loop, by the way, but we export an asynchronous function which is called the insert batch. So you basically, as you can see, as a first argument, you pass the DB, so you actually mutate the original database by inserting new data. And then you perform search. In that case, we get the database. <clears throat> we perform search for the term if on all the properties. Eventually, you can also say, OK, um, not on all the properties, just on, let's say, quotes. So I pass an array, including just the properties I want to perform my query on. And the elapsed property that you see here, 99, can you guess what is it? Seconds, milliseconds? What, sorry? Minutes, yes, <laughs> hours, days. No, it's actually microseconds. I wish it was minutes, but no, it's actually microseconds. So we are in the millionth of a second area. And you might say, yes, but you inserted just for, for documents. So of course it's fast. For that reason, on my machine, on M1 Pro MacBook, I did a benchmark. And for example, um, I took whatever I could find on the International Movie Database, uh, so titles, quotes, descriptions, cast, whatever. I put it into Lyra, and I said, okay, let's search Believe through one million entries, and it took just 41 microseconds. Again, we are in the millionth of a second area here. So then I said, okay, maybe I can try just on the title property, 39 microseconds, which is almost the same. Then I tried with Criminal Minds, you know? Uh, I'm a big fan of the show. Um, with Criminal Minds, full text search engines have to perform two distinct queries. Have to perform a query on Criminal, a query on Minds, then look into a forward index to see if Minds is happening after Criminal and give it more priority, etc. So there's a bunch of stuff to do and it takes just 187 microseconds again. So it's really, really performant if you ask me. And nowadays, it supports 23 languages. So if you, like me, don't know nothing about Dutch, for example, I wish I, I did, but I know nothing about Dutch, you don't have to perform stemming operations on Dutch. So when I talk, or, or Italian, I'm Italian, I could do that, but the stemming algorithms are not that easy, and I'm getting there in one moment. So basically, when we talk about stemming, for example, we refer to that process to take the stem of an individual token. For example, we have Lucky, we stem it to luck. So we actually insert the meaning of the word rather than the entire word. Of course, if someone puts like lucky, we could store both. So you can have like exact match search or whatever, but that's another story. And with Lira, you can always extend whatever you want. So you can, uh, given that Lira basically provides you a series of indexes, you can create your own searching algorithm if you want. You can create your own stemmer, and we will get there. How do I create a stemmer? Well, if you're into natural language processing, for example, I would recommend you looking into Snowball. Snowball, it's an open source project created by Martin uh, Porter, which is the author of the Porter stemmer. <coughs> Sorry, which is nothing more uh, than um, um, an algorithm, a step-by-step -step algorithm description that if you follow it, will help you creating stem, uh, stems from words, for example, uh, search for the longest among the suffixes. So if our word ends with S, we just remove it. If our word ends with S, S, E, S, we perform that operation. So, you know, step by step, we can create it and you can have a lot of fun. It's <clears throat> super difficult if you ask me, but it's definitely very funny. And just for giving you an example, we have like consign, which gets stemmed to consign again. 
then we have consigned the past form, which again, we keep the meaning, consigned. So this is what uh, Lira is doing for you every single time you insert a new token. And again, you can do it in Italian, we support Italian, we support German, we support 23 languages, or you create just your stemming function. The goal for Lira is to empower people to learn more about these algorithms. So you can, for example, gave an ish suffix to all of your words. So if you put like hello, it becomes hello-ish, you know, whatever, why not? You can do it. You can also customize stop words. Whatever the processes that Lyra is running, you can always customize that. So the project goals for Lyra were to work on any JavaScript runtimes, and we did it. Uh, to be as small as possible, as fast as possible, and easy to deploy and maintain, because that was my original problem with Elastic, you know? So the achievements for Lyra, okay, it works on every JavaScript runtime, it's small and modular, it's quite fast if you ask me, can be deployed literally wherever JavaScript runs, <clears throat> and you can also serialize data in different formats, and has a powerful plugin system. So let me give you an example of a plugin. Um, you might want to persist your data on disk at a certain point, so you just install Lyra search, plugin data persistence, you create your instance, so original instance in that case, you put um, a couple of quotes and authors. Then you use the persist to file function, which is runtime specific, that works on BAN and uh, Node.js specifically. And you just choose the format. You, by default, you use this message pack, which is a, form, a serialization format also used by Redis, for example. So you can use message pack that by default, DPAC, JSON, protocol buffers, you can do whatever you want, basically. And after you did that on another file, as you can see, I'm, I'm not like Matteo, I'm not going, doing live demos, I'm not at that level yet, uh, but <laughs> you can restore data from disk and start performing searches. So now that we know what Lyra is, I wanted to give you a couple of target architectures. For example, let's say that you have a React Native application. You have a Lyra server, which performs search, actually, and you have your application. You can continue pulling from the server, and when the connection is down, you can say, okay, I will fall back to the local database, which might be like a SQLite or an in-memory database or whatever. Or, and this is more interesting for me, you can create a very, okay, very distributed, doesn't make sense, but a highly distributed system uh, by deploying your Lyra indexes serialized on S3. You can notify SNS, for example, which rebuilds some lambdas, performs some optimizations, and makes it available, the new index, to CloudFront, so that after you query something, you have a Lambda running on the edge <clears throat> performing the searches for you and caching everything. So you treat Lyra as an immutable database, and if you need to update, remove, do stuff on the index, you just do it as a batch operation every five minutes, every minute, whatever. So you can't forget about cluster management, deployment, data consistency. AWS takes care of cluster management when it comes to uh, uh, Lambda functions, for example. Deployment, we will see in a moment. Data consistency, we'll see again. You can deploy to anywhere using Nebula, which is still experimental, but I have, again, I'm not doing a live demo, but I have a recording from my friend Paolo uh, deploying uh, Pokédex to Cloudflare workers, for example. So let's see if we have internet connections. So first thing we do, we look at the uh, we, we basically install uh, the Nebula package, which is a global NPM package. We just use uh, Nebula. And yeah, Lyra is named after the Lyra constellation, and Nebulas are where stars get born, and et cetera. Yeah, that's crazy. Okay, so if we look at the files we have, we basically have a data.json file, which represents the data we want to deploy to Cloudflare, for example, and Lyra.yaml. If we go see the Lyra.yaml file, it basically has a schema, which is a schema definition for our data, uh, sharding, auto, true, false, uh, it's not working yet, so just don't use it. <laughs> we will get, give support as soon as possible. An output, output file, so we can decide wherever we want to uh, deploy to Cloudflare, which we are gonna do, or keep a copy of your data locally. Um, then the data we actually want to deploy, in that case, type JSON, because we are taking the data from a JSON file, and the JSON file itself, but, we could also say, okay, the type is JavaScript, so we use a JavaScript file exporting an asynchronous function so that you can call a database, for example, and take asynchronous data and feed Lyra and then deploy it. 
Again, uh, target, in that case it's Cloudflare, could be Netlify, could be AWS, whatever. Uh, configurations, uh, worker name, Pokédex, why not? And if you want to run tests, true or false. If we go ahead the JSON data, uh, we will see that basically we already um, created a JSON file with the same uh, schema as the schema definition for Lira. So we are ready. Let's clear everything and run Nebula D, which stands for deploy, of course. And in just like five seconds, you just deployed a Cloudflare worker. So as you can see at uh, Pokédex, which is the name we gave, uh, Paolo, thank you again for doing that, <laughs> which is your Cloudflare account, for example, .workers.dev, and if you use CURL, you just run queries on Cloudflare. So your congratulation, you just deployed the first full text search engine capable of running at the edge. So, uh, I don't know where is my mouse. Oh, here it is, okay. So as I was saying, Lira, it's free and open source. You just go to GitHub, Lira search at Lira. Please open issues, please ask for stuff, please do whatever you need to get work, uh, start working with Lira. I'll be there to help you guide you through target architectures or I don't know, whatever you need to get this up and running on your service provider of choice. We also just created, like today, a Slack channel, which is called lirasearch.slack.com. So again, if you need anything, just ping me here. I will try to answer as soon as possible. Before I finish my talk, I'd like to thank Nearform for multiple things. First of all, for letting me work on Lira, for uh, letting me be there today. Uh, I guess you already know Nearform. We are a professional services company. We hire in, um, um, in US, um, Europe, uh, Brazil, Canada, so if you're looking for a fully remote job uh, in a company that knows something about JavaScript, please reach out the booth um, or reach out after the talk. So that was all for me, thanks, thank you. And I leave my contacts just in case you want to reach out. Thank you.